in this next segment, as we move forward, um, we've got a lovely artist, Diana Molina, who has been doing some really cutting edge work. Um, Diana Molina is an artist and author, and she's, she's going to present her book, Icons and Symbols of the Borderland, Art from the U.S.-Mexico Crossroads, as part of her retrospective exhibition at the MAC. This collection of artwork, poetry, and essay combines tradition, culture, history, and nature in a variety of subjects and themes that touch on everything from the religious to the mythological to the commercial and socio-political. She's gonna be opening her exhibit on September 18th and it's gonna be a virtual exhibit opening. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, a timeline at the crossroads. Con ustedes, damas y caballeros, enjoy. Uh, good evening, everybody. We're here for the exhibition opening of Dos Equis, Timeline at the Crossroads Dos Equis, featuring author and artist Diana Molina at the Mexican American Cultural Center. So, welcome, Diana. Thank you, Rebecca. Good to see all of you. Diana is going to go oh. over a oh, brief oh. introduction, her exhibition, and then we're going to follow up with studio visits from five of the artists that are featured in her book, Icons and Symbols of the Borderland. Um, Diana, would you like to share your slideshow with us? Yes, yes, thank you for the introduction. As Rebecca said, this is a, a retrospective of my work, so I'm showing several series. We're kicking it off with the first collection from the Tarumara. This is a Tarumara rattle. And um, it's from one of the first series, a photographic series in my collection from the Tarumara. I'm showing in this image uh, a belt, the baskets, photographs. And um, in this uh, portrait retrospective, I want to start with a few words. I will have my serpent's tongue, my woman's voice, my sexual voice, my poet's voice. I will overcome the tradition of silence. It is from Gloria Andalzua, Borderlands, La Frontera, The New Mestiza. And I start with, with Michaca means moon. Um, and this entire retrospective is um, presenting this dimensions of the Mestiza experience, beginning with myself. And I begin with the Tarumara because a great, actually I have more um, DNA heritage from the Tarumara than my Spanish ancestry. So my tie to this subject is, is um, very deep. Michaca is a young girl that I know in the Sierra. And the, this is a Copper Canyon, three, actually four canyons deeper than the Grand Canyon. You can see the Huarachi worn by the woman here. And uh, these are made from recycled tires. And the series shows the images from the outdoors where they are cooking, the diet, the, the metate, which has ancient uh, roots, ancient um, history from centuries ago, the Chile. This is within the traditions of the Tarumara for the Semana Santa. And here with runners, they are known for their running. Here she is in an ultra marathon race, um, 50 miles against marathon runners from across the globe, actually and the spiritual on Alta, uh, Un Altar, uh, Guadalupe. This is um, Tencha, a, a young friend of mine, family friend, and at her home altar. Now we switch to the next series, Morena Moderna, contemporary depictions of the Virgen de Guadalupe. With this image, it shows the uh, transnational representation as many of the images that I are in the series will show between the Mexican, between the American flags and landscape. 
And so many of these are just, you know, not only the personal journey, but personal depictions. And in the race of light here with the stained glass, I have um, pictures of my mother and Aunt Becky, my grandmother, uh, Nilda de la Yata, uh, who's um, also been a part of the Austin community, Marta Cotera over here, with, um, who was one of the key figures in the uh, origins of the Mexican American Cultural Center. And now these are matachines, which is a, a dance which originates in, in Italy, the, the dance between the, the Moors and Christians. And um, this is actually on the dirt road um, that leads to my home on, on a desert mesa. Now we're in Mexico City, and this is Ilana Lapid. She is also a Juntos artist and filmmaker. Uh, on this particular trip, she uh, accompanied me to, to um, the event when the Pope uh, went to Mexico City for uh, the um, sainthood by Juan Diego. So this image shows the Pope, Guadalupe, and Telmex too. And here's another example of the commercialism. This, t this image is called Bendita Eres entre todas las mujeres and it shows the image of the virgen within the two commercial depictions of contemporary women the next series is seven string barbed wire fence the faces of latino immigration to the u.s here is what they call the mica card with the woman embedded in the sign and with all the rallies that are going on, oh, this is the, uh, it keeps forwarding on its own, I'm sorry. Um, Rally for Immigration Reform. This is called Rally for the Future. This is Maria Elena Durazo and Maria Jimenez, um, along with the uh, union workers and united efforts at the uh, Edmund Pettus Bridge they were the originators of the immigrant workers' freedom ride, where we had buses that crossed the, the country um, ad, in advocacy for immigrant rights, immigrants reform. This image is uh, the represents the uh, changing demographics of the, the United States, of the, the landscape of faces, also with women in, and who represent the, uh, the, well, in its entirety, the, the potential for the Latino vote, voting bloc and the impact it has on, on our elections, on um, the, the direction that the country is going and the representation of, of the mix and the, the changing colors of the American stripes. And this is an example of a wall and the patchwork of the wall. Um, much of the funding, I believe, except for 10 miles, much of the funding that has gone to the wall in the Trump administration has gone to fortifying existing sections of wall. And this provides an illustration of, of that the breasting, the breaking, the, the, just the entire patchwork that actually extends across the sections wherever the wall may be. It's an ongoing maintenance cost involved there. Now I switch to landscape, uh, Viva Chihuahua, symbols of survival in the desert landscape. This is the landscape that I inhabit and, and as, as women, as, um, symbols, womanhood as, as the symbol of, of life and um, all it brings, that connection to Mother Nature. We think of her as a woman. This is at White Sands National Park, and I start with the rainbow and clouds and storm because rainfall and the weather and the climate crisis is so relevant to us in the Chihuahuan Desert. It is... Um, just in the month of August, we generally get two inches. We've had five, five, uh, half an inch. Two inches is what we get today. This month, we've only gotten half an inch. 
So the water, these are the, the, the spiky, the delicacy within the spiky shell of the cactus environment and blooms. Again, the water, stressing the importance of the water for the, um, the life-giving aspects of it with the rivers, the streams, the Rio Grande, the Gila River. The agave, also called mezcal, um, also with um, life-giving food. Uh, the, the mezcalero apache take their name from this plant. Um, it retains water through the roots and retains and captures it and, and stores it in the roots and has one big flowering and then it dies. And generally it depends on how much water, but it'll take um, many, you know, up to 20 years, it, it, it just varies. But that is why it's also called the century plant. This is the uh, Bosque de la Pache, also a watershed with cranes. Cranes are one of the, um, the uh, oldest, oldest, uh, birds that they take flight they're on land and water so very symbolic and these are the ocotillos um, which bloom a red red blossom and um, are very medicinal oops it's kind of has a mind of its own here now this ser series pura basura from recycled materials <clears throat> it is my it's tapestry that is made of, of debris, uh, literally debris. Barcode labels, beer bottle labels, candy wrappers. This one is called Serapi, Serape Diamondback. Diamondback Serape, which is modeled after the um, Diamondback Rattlers around my home. This is the Dos Equis. Um, this is the signature piece of the exhibit and representing the female chromosomes along with everything else it represents. Twice 2020 for the timeline um, and a representation of, of the very popular be beverage and again the tapestries, the, the influence of tapestries over different cultures and, and over the centuries to our um, landscape. And this takes a sacred symbol of the, um, this is called Corazón Espinado, taking um, inspiration from the Sagrado Corazón with the bleeding heart. And um, also, you know, representing, representative of the sugar, what we consume, the, the beer beverages, and what it does to our heart and what it does for our spirit and what the debris, um, the impact in, in, total, in totality of, of the debris that uh, we are generating. This is Serape de la Agave, and it is um, inspired by the agave plant that I showed earlier in my Viva Chihuahua section. And Cosmos. This um, was created for a collector and friend of mine. And uh, he wanted the representation of the desert mesa I live upon. So this was uh, created in the autumn going into winter, representing the woman, uh, the mountains, the, um, the Gemini constellation, which is um, my, con my uh, zodiac sign, the way the moon was with Venus the comet when that flew too close to the sun. So all with symbols. And now, now I move on to uh, an inst installation for the exhibit. And uh, on the pedestals is my grandfather's typewriter, which I would play and type on since, oh, since I was, um, a young child, be, you know, as soon as I could talk and move and walk, I was typing on that typewriter and I inherited it. And so the link, uh, the link here is, is with the book in the, uh, 
the result of the personal experience, the tie of the personal experience, the family, the stories, and how that influences, um, how that influenced my creative process. Here in this um, autoretrato that I created with my, with my mom, um, I show my first camera, my grandfather Angel's paperweight, um, picture of my parents with me as a child, and just the setting of, of the geographic location and family. And again, my grandfather at his little store, first shoe, and those kind of details. But just that storytelling um, that uh, I grew up with, that we, we all grew up, grow up with over the years from family and objects. And how it led to the, the book, Icons and Symbols of the Borderland, which um, I'm very thrilled about and, and especially uh, grateful to every Juntos artist for their participation in, in the process. And, and that's also part of the, uh, the joy of, of the pursuit of, of the
and um, this is where you can get the book. I will pass this on to to Rebecca now, um, and we have a, a video that features the book. But this is the information about the book. That is the Juntos website, and uh, that's where you can order the book, and the proceeds from book sales will support the efforts by the Juntos Art Association Education and Outreach Programming. Yes, thank you, Deanna. And so now we're on to our Dos X Pura Mujer, Dos X Studio Visits. Um, and Diana came up with the idea of celebrating the woman because 2020 represents the 100 years since the woman's suffrage and our right to vote. And so to honor that, she selected artists from the icons and symbols of the borderland exhibition, traveling exhibition and publication, as she just mentioned, to feature through a series of studio visits. And for our first artist, we will be speaking with Cesar Martinez. Um, Cesar Martinez, he was born in Laredo, Texas. Uh, he's primarily known for his paintings of pachucos, but he's done so much more than that. And he is a, was a, ma he is a major figure, figure in the Chicano art movement of the 1970s and 80s. He's still based in, in Texas, in San Antonio, and he is a major icon of art history here in Texas. And we are here to share some of his work today and hear what he has to say. And Diana had selected this first image here because it was the cover of our, of our book. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about this, this particular piece? This is the piece that uh, actually responsible for, for um, meeting you, um, I'm gonna say 17 years ago now when I paid a studio, a live studio visit to you. Um, and this was one of the pieces as I was working on the Virgen de Guadalupe project and, and um, went to Cesar's studio and found the, this piece, another Guadalupe and Cesar too. Cesar, please um, share more information, uh, share the story behind this image. It's a long story, but uh, everything comes from my uh, from my memory, from my experiences, people I have met, pictures I have seen, and so on and so forth. And uh, this particular uh, piece originated with uh, a neighbor that I had who was a he was a mechanic, a big man, and. Uh, he did not have any tattoos like this, but his neighbor did have some. So I sort of combined both of those uh, characters. And uh, I, uh, when I was trying to decide what kind of uh, tattoos to put on, put on his arms, I decided that, well, a lot of these guys that I see here in the radio, they have women on their arms. Uh, and... Uh, so, uh, you know, the, on the arms, I put some women. Uh, originally, on the chest, I was going to have a big crucifix because that is what the uh, the other man in the neighborhood had on his chest, a big uh, crucifix. But then after thinking about it, it occurred to me that I was kind of like uh, unwittingly making a statement about macho attitudes towards women. So uh, the Virgen de Guadalupe became very, very relevant to that. Kind of became like, you know, there's a good girl and a bad girl and what can be interpreted as any number of types of women. It could be a matriarch, it could be a, somebody's mother, or it can just be the, the Virgen de Guadalupe. And so, and so there it is, I realized that I was making a a statement when originally I, I only wanted to do a guy with tattoo. Well, it certainly makes a statement and, and uh, it, it uh, is very uh, representative of the, the schisms between how women are portrayed and how uh, women are treated by, by males, how, you know, the, uh, the, the attitude of women 
of men towards males. Now we'll move to these other pieces. Uh, these are uh, the, the one with the uh, blue color surrounding the figure. It's a very early uh, piece. I think I did that in the uh, 19, I mean, yeah, 1980s. And uh, it was simply based on a woman from probably the 1940s with a hairstyle and all of that. And uh, the other one originated with uh, a picture in my, uh, I think it was, yeah, it was my junior high school uh, yearbook. And it was a girl who went through school with me uh, from all the way from elementary to uh, high school. And uh, I kind of liked uh, her hair. This is not really a portrait of that young young woman, but, but I appropriated certain uh, characteristics and did a painting of a, an older woman. Well, I can see you like big hair. Um, uh, tell us about these. Well, big hair is, is, I heard a woman say about another woman, oh, she has big hair. And I said to myself, well, I like that. <laughs> I'm going to use that. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, uh, and this is probably one of the very first uh, women with uh, what we call big hair, or what women call big hair. <laughs> Uh, it never occurred to me that there was a name for that. But anyway, uh, I think that this one was done probably in the 90s, although it's possible it was done in the 80s also. It's an early piece. The other piece uh, is more, uh, more uh, well, not, not that. It was done in the 1990s. And it is a woman that, that I saw in a picture because I have a scrapbook that has a lot of... Uh, pictures that I cut out from whatever source I find. Most of them are from uh, obituaries. But this one was, uh, I think it was a picture in uh, an old uh, a low rider magazine. At one time they had this wonderful section that had old pictures. And uh, so uh, that is where, where that one comes from. It's just an example of a woman probably from the 1940s. And what are the titles to these? Uh, well, the, the obvious one is Mujer con Big Hair. The other one, I don't remember. I, just, uh, I don't remember. <laughs> okay, we'll move on to the next ones. Uh, obviously, well, one of them, the one in, in color, is another variation of the one you just saw. And uh, her name, by the way, was Guadalupe Gonzalez. Uh, so I think that the title of these ones, uh, I usually put uh, Guadalupe G. And uh, this is another version. Just about everything that I do uh, has many versions because I always think of something else I can do. And uh, this is a good example of that. I needed to say something about the drawing. The drawing is very recent, but it is a woman that is based on a neighbor of mine. She was a big woman, uh, very, uh, uh, very generous woman, very uh, happy woman, like to party and what have you. And uh, so uh, this uh, it is a representation of that memory that I have of that neighbor. Okay, go on to the next. These two or other are also uh, versions of La Chata. It's a woman I call La Chata. Uh, I don't know if I said that in when describing the drawing, but, but uh, these are all titled La Chata, and these are all versions of the same woman. Same woman with a different dress. Yeah, well, different. Uh, but she likes the same style. But, you know, basically it's a big woman. <laughs> yes, yes, big woman. This is another version of Mujer con Big Hair, and uh, the hair here is kind of incredible, but... Uh, I have a picture of, <laughs> from where I got that. And uh, 
I was doing basically uh, a drawing of another woman with a, an unusual big uh, hairdo, probably from the 50s. And uh, I also have a, in my source book, in my scrapbook, there was a, an obituary of this a fairly young woman. She was obviously a, a, uh, a big woman or a chubby woman. And, but she had the most... Uh, perfect features I've ever seen, very smooth. Everything was about her face was very smooth. So since I was on, she did not have big hair, but uh, I put big hair on her. But I was simply using the this very wonderful old uh, photograph. And tell me a little more about these sketches in the way of your process that um, as I, as I um, have witnessed you, um, create these just uh, in the morning after you have your coffee or um, you know just uh, in, in informal settings well I get to where I want to go in many different ways uh, usually it starts with some small drawing uh, and then uh, it goes on to something else sometimes I actually project pictures uh, I, I actually project a picture of my source and then trace it. These two particular ones, these drawings are freehand drawings. And uh, for a long time, I was afraid of drawing because drawing is a thing in itself. And I never did drawings like exhibition quality drawings. They were all working drawings. They had stuff wrong with them and what have you, but I would put them in the computer, fix them up and create my characters and uh, project those on the canvas and trace them and then paint them. But very recently, only a few months ago, I decided that I needed to uh, start drawing, <laughs> finally. <laughs> and to my surprise, it kind of came easy. And uh, these are all pen pencil drawings, pencils on paper, of course. And uh, I started drawing and then, uh, my surprise you, but I do these lying down. <laughs> uh, I do, I mean, uh, instead of uh, reading a magazine to get sleepy at night, I start drawing until I get very sleepy. The problem is that sometimes I get so absorbed in the drawings that I'm doing that, that it goes on and on until it's like early morning hours. Sometimes I do go, go to sleep earlier but then I might wake up like at two or three in the morning and can't go, go back to sleep. So I turn on the light, start drawing until, uh, uh, until I get sleepy again or it starts to get dead. And, uh, but anyway, that's kind of like my process. But I don't have any, there is no set way that I have of doing anything. I have no technique for anything. I just do it. Uh, these two are, uh, one is a painting, uh, one is uh, a young woman with somebody's uh, high school uh, letter jacket. And I think that this was the title of this one, the Charles girlfriend with, uh, uh, with his letter jacket. Uh, he was an athlete, uh, the girlfriend of an athlete. The other one, I had gotten a request to do kind of like working class people. And I decided to do a woman with a uh, with a hard hat uh, helmet, construction helmet. And uh, the person that I did them for didn't like them, and uh, so I said, "Well, um, see you later." <laughs> uh, that one that one is now in the collection of the University of Texas at San Antonio, along with a, a male uh, counterpart. Great. Well, let's, uh, let's, um, these are the last two images. Um, if you could speak about these. Yeah, well, one is a woman from La Prale, uh, an obituary picture from the 1930s, a, uh, a woman with a, a lot of makeup around the eyes, very dark, very mysterious looking, like those silent uh, movie stars from, from the before sound movies. And I did a, a painting of her, not, not no particular name to it. The other one is uh, is a more general thing, and it's about things that uh, people sometimes don't want to mention. Like this woman was probably somebody's uh, a married man's uh, girlfriend, uh, 
And uh, so they would be in the barrio, they would call these women, una, you know, they, they would not mention them by name. Even if they knew the name, they would say, una fulana, you know. And they saw the man with una fulana somewhere or somewhere else. And uh, so anyway, I decided in my mind, I wanted to, uh, what would a fulana look like? So it's kind of glamorous <laughs> in a funky way. And that's what I came up with. Well, anyway, that's where I was at. <laughs> I have done... Well, so many of these women are, um, you know, they're women I recognize, the women that I've grown up with or seen or remind me of somebody else. Very, very well, strong. Uh, the idea, something I should say about my work in general, all of these characters that I, that I come up with, like I said, they're not actual likenesses. They are in some cases. But generally, there are characters like in the way that a, uh, a writer creates a character. And they're very effective because a writer embellishes. It might not be one person. It might be a composite. And that's what these are. And that's why they are effective. Uh, I want yes, very to, interesting composites. I, uh, I want them to uh, strike a universal tone. This is somebody you've probably seen somewhere. And I get that comment a lot, and it's kind of like music to my ears when I hear that, because uh, that's the whole idea. These are very universal to the Chicano uh, cultural experience. And everybody says something, like, oh, I've seen that guy, you know, I've seen her. And uh, so that's, that's one of the big ideas behind this particular series. Well, great to, great to see your representation of women. We're going to be, uh, thank, thank you so much, Cesar. We're going to be switching to Davina now. I believe you have a, another engagement. Is that correct? Well, I'll be hanging around, but I'm not going to be sitting <laughs> here. <laughs> no, no. I'm talking about Davina. It'll be on. I'm going to go to my, my okay. computer. Okay, okay, okay great. Uh, um, good, seeing, good seeing all of you. Yes, thank you. We need to uh, yeah. switch to Davina now. Okay, if you'd uh, go ahead and introduce Davinia. Davinia. Uh, Davinia Mirabal was born in Mexico City, where she studied graphic communications at the National University uh, in 1998. And that was the same year that she came to the U.S. to continue her passion in art. In 2005, she earned her BFA in medals at UTEP. And she has received many awards and scholarships during her time. Then in 2007, she earned a master's degree in art, his, in art I'm sorry, majoring in metals and painting. And uh, she's part of the U University of Texas El Paso and the El Paso Community College teaching faculty. Um, and we are here today with Davinia, who's going to speak more about her pieces that are um, specifically her piece that's in the exhibition and book, as well as some additional works by Davinia. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, you know, basically what I do for, um, like the big exhibits is, um, installations. Uh, most of my work is, uh, in jewelry, but for when I have big, uh, shows, I do installations that are based on jewelry. So, uh, if you want to go back to the other slide. There we go. These are the four torsos. Yes, perfect. So each one of them um, have a necklace. So that is the jewelry part where my installations are based on. And um, these necklaces were made thinking about all the days that sp specifically me as a woman have gone through. Um, this piece was done right after uh, my divorce. And um, the torsos are made with um, paper that I collected from my credit card statements because, you know, financially, uh, divorce is devastating. Um, it, uh, the final torso has my di divorce decree that I, you know, pieced it all together in, in, to make the torso. And then um, the other ones have uh, my appointment um, my appointments that I had, you know, like to go to the lawyer and do this and, you know, like kind of continue with your life. We have a little visitor that doesn't want to go away. There you go. Um, 
so basically that is what's happening with this this uh, installation each of the flowers in the necklaces um, reflects one day how did that how did it feel um, and the stones the different colors of stones are for uh, the month that we are going through so each single flower it's a day of the year and I did this collection for probably a year and a half maybe almost two years and again you know it's um it was my journey as a woman after my divorce but you know like um one of the torsos the last one it's almost unfinished um in the in the part of the necklace and uh, and that it's because we are uh, waiting for a better outcome. We don't know what is coming. We um, we hope for the best. That you know the struggle is passing, and um, that heavy weight of the necklaces right there on your neck, kind of you know, tiding within you it's getting looser and looser and looser and our journey will be better. So that when is... When I first saw this... Oh, go piece. ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I, I saw this piece um, at the Ruben, Ruben uh, Gallery at the university. Um, this was before I knew you and it had such an impact on me. Um, just the, the, the depth, the story, and, and I, I, it was really great to... Uh, to get the backstory um, once I met you, but I've always um, felt very strongly about this particular piece. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, if you want to move to the other piece, right there. That one is called uh, Ancient Remedies for uh, Rape, Ghosting, uh, Psychological Abuse and Abandonment. And I was making this piece again in is another series of necklaces each one it's a necklace uh, that you can wear and I was thinking about the illness of our times uh, how you know like nowadays we just hear about you know like how in India they rape a woman every three seconds and you know, like a lot of stuff like that. And of course now with technology, uh, how, you know, we were dating someone and then they disappeared, they have ghosting us. And so I was, you know, thinking about that, like, you know, this, let's call them illness, right? They're mostly suffered by women, of course by men too, but the majority is the women that have to go through it. So the necklaces uh, carry tea. Um, the little pouches have tea, a mix of tea leaves. And I'm using those as a, like a, an alternative also to our, con, uh, to our current opioid um, abuse and problem. Uh, you know, like if you were raped, you go to the doctor and they give you I don't know, Xanax or, you know, something to calm you down or volume to make you sleep and, you know, like forget about pain and this and that, you know, and they make us addicts. So I was thinking that maybe we can use that tea as an alternative to that. And, you know, especially because, um, you know, how people say that women are, full of hormones and then when we are in our period we are crazy and so we should they, we should just keep us medicated right so i don't think um that is the way to go so again that's why i'm offer offering that tea alternative and you know it's kind of like going back to our roots to our traditions and uh, how our mothers used to cure us with, you know, chamomile tea because our tummy was hurting or, you know, and if it doesn't really work, it will comfort us. It will give us peace of mind. And it, it was a piece for, 
for you to think, you know, like, should I pop two pills or should I sit down for two minutes and drink this tea that I'm wearing on my necklace? I can just pull it out and put it into a cup of tea right there instantly. And um, it, it's something that we just need to think about, you know, how our new society, it's just going into the pills. It's, you know, provoking certain um, ailments and dysfunctional uh, families and things like that. So that is what I'm trying to hit with this um, with this installation. And actually both installations are interactive. Um, when I presented this at the, at the gallery, I was actually serving the tea there for the people who attended. And um, they will pick if they wanted, you know, like feel better about rape or ghosting or psychological abuse or, you know, that they felt abandoned. And, you know, I will serve them the tea to make them feel better, at least for a little bit. Um, the, the other one, the living, the dream, it uh, actually has the voice of my ex-husband um, inside the necklaces and uh, it's a recording. So um, you can see, you can hear him, you know, talking to me on the phone, saying things that nobody should say to each other. And then, you know, some of my responses also. Um, so both pieces are interactive in a certain way. They really bring you to be part of the piece. It's not just something to see, but it's something for you to think and that at certain point you can also wear and you can keep it with you close to your heart. So those are- well, They have a cathartic, uh, a cathartic impact, I believe, uh, in, the, in the processing that, that you have gone through and that you continue to go through. And I would say extremely relevant to uh, our 2020 experience when so many women are suffering from domestic abuse and mm -hmm. uh, depression and the ailments, everything is more amplified during this time. Yes. And these pieces really, really speak to it in, in, a, in a very relevant way as, um, as we address these, um, the challenge of the, of the day that yeah. uh, is part of women's life. So, Rebecca, do you have anything to add to, to the conversation with Davina? No, I was I'm very fascinated to learn more about these pieces. I had seen them um, in the book, but it's wonderful to hear you explain about how these are receipts and pieces of your past. And I love how on the last one you've left room uh, for the future and, mm -hmm. you know, what's to come. So it's very fascinating that you shared it with us. Thank you so much. No, thank you for the invitation and for the opportunity. Thank you, Davinia. Thank you. Dan. Now we will move to um, Victoria Suesco. Rebecca, if you could please um, introduce Victoria. Victoria was born to Panamanian parents, and she's a longtime resident of San Antonio. Her work has been exhibited internationally since. 1983 in all over the world and she's had many honors including the McDowell Connolly Award and she served as visiting artist guest speaker um, and a secretary of the board for the Blue Star Art Space in San Antonio she's also an associate professor um, at the Austin Community College and she earned her Master's of Fine Arts from UT San Antonio and we're really proud to have her here today. She also, she also has an exhibit at the McNay right now. So we're wonderful that she's made some time to come and speak with us here. Thank you very much, Rebecca. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you, Diana, for all of your support of artists and women 
in, especially through Juntos and especially through your publication of the book for Juntos. Um, I have painted a lot of women in my work and I paint from a woman's point of view, obviously. So some of my paintings are about women in their habitat. <laughs> and this is a Panamanian woman in Panama, and you will notice that on the right there is a bull saying, Hay carne de rey y puerco aquí todos los días. And that is from the vernacular. That is, the, that is inspired by signage that you see outside mom and pop shops in Spanish-speaking portions of the Americas. And I grew up surrounded by these images. I did not have access to museums. So these are my museum. My museum is from the streets. Mi museo está en la calle. And so you will notice that language plays a, a big part of my work. And so I carnes de res is misspelled. Then we have septentria, which is very, very fancy, a very fancy word for one of the directions, east, west, north, south. Then we have some Spanish, Bahia Onda, some French, Dampierre, who's one of the um, buccaneers that came through Panama and stole all kinds of things probably. And there's his ship down there on the right. That's one of the Conquistadors ship actually. And we can go to the next slide. Rebecca, do you want to go on to the next slide? It's on the next slide. I've moved it, I believe. Perfect. Um, this one is called Tremendo Manicure, and it was the keystone painting for a show at the Museo Alameda, which at the time was the first Smithsonian-affiliated museum in the south of the United States, and it is no longer in existence. It is currently the Centro de Artes, and it is a painting in which a woman faces a Venus de Milo, behind her is a bottle of detergent, below her is a hand receiving a manicure, and um, the idea being that we are, women are deceived by advertising that the detergent is gonna make our hands nice and soft and we will be as beautiful as the Venus de Milo, but that is not the case, you just get stuck doing the dishes. And the painting is framed with skills I learned making piñatas as a child, and it is plastic that is harvested from wading pools and other plastic things that are abandoned at the end of summer and left in people's front lawns. Next slide. This one is Loncheria La Sirena, and you can see that um, it is advertising pescado frito as its specialty of the house, which is fried fish, and but the sirena the mermaid is actually carrying a plate of chicken, and I have no doubt that some of the guests would actually rather have her for lunch. So there is all of that play between images and words that don't quite go together, but when you do absorb them together, they lead you to new meaning. Um, again, this woman is flanked by two figures. On one side is the male pa, mano de... Piedra Duran, and on the left is the Venus again, the Milo. And so those are the two sort of gold standards for male and female. And the mermaid is her own gold standard. And those, um, the painting is huge, it's about four by five feet tall, four feet wide. And I just put her in a niche, in a niche. And, um, the, and that is the Venus and Mano de Piedra are painted directly on the wall. So together, all of this is probably about 12 feet tall. Next slide. This is imagery inspired by a beauty parlor called Salon de Belleza Lupita and beauty parlors, which are parlors of beauty, um, like a fine arts gallery, are where I first learned the word aesthetic. And I did not understand what people were telling me or talking about when they would use the word aesthetic in graduate school. And then I realized, oh, when I saw it in the beauty parlor, oh, that's what they've been talking about. So I learned about beauty and finessing and making things look a certain way and your taste in the things that you like. I, all that idea of aesthetic, I learned it in a beauty parlor. And in this case, you have, it's a unisex parlor. And so you have the man on the left. But the funny thing is that 
the, they look like they're having an argument. I don't know how the people in this beauty parlor thought somebody would think, oh, I need my hair cut. I'm going to go in there. <laughs> this doesn't, it's not your normal type of advertising. Next slide. These are objects that are used to draw women and make us think that good things will happen, but they're actually just a lot of work. So you have a blow dryer on the left, and then you have a diamond ring on the right-hand side. So big hair and weddings are a lot of work. Next. This um, piece is what I call, is one of what I call my six packs. And I just recombine images and put them together. And in this case, you have the woman from Salon de Belleza Lupita below a sign in the middle top, which advertises the services that our beauty parlor will offer. And as you can see, it is unisex. And um, you have the carnes de res figured again. On the bottom left, you have carniceria, um, which, <laughs> which has, instead of beef, it has chick, a chicken underneath, but it's also misspelled with an S. And there is a lot that I could say about any of the images that I have already shown you or, or these, but really I hope that every person just looks at them, that they play off of each other, and that you draw your own reading. Make, this, make these stories, bring them into your life. This is Mujer Bien Peinada, and this is another woman being used to lure you into the beauty parlor. And she has this very nice necklace on and big earrings. So it, it reminds me of the 80s, you know, that you'd want this sort of quaff. And um, I, I, again, am inspired by the vernacular that I see. And beauty parlors are just one of the big number one storefronts that still have painted signage on the outside. So carnicerias, ferreterias, salones de belleza. Those are the, the, and auto body shops. Those are the most common types of signage that you will find. This is a painting that has traveled all around the world. I went to the 50th Venice Biennale. I was a part of the Panamanian delegation official there. And it is a woman who displaces Leonardo da Vinci's man from Vitruvius man, and she is now Vitruvius woman. And she is a native woman. She is not, not a Spanish woman. But look at how generous she is. She has so many arms, and she is breastfeeding a child, and she still has an extra hand to welcome the, that boatload of Spaniards that's coming over to South America. Above her head is a, a ceramic of, an, of the pre-Columbian, of the pre, I should say pre-arrival uh, artwork that existed in Central America. And it is a Native American wearing a jaguar skin. And so she is crowned with this Native head as she welcomes the Spanish men. And it was seen in a marketplace in Ecuador where this work also traveled to a Biennial in Cuenca. And I, I'm sorry, this painting did not travel. I was in the Biennial in Cuenca and I saw in the marketplace they were advertising panties, bikini. So they had misspelled bikini and my name is Victoria and I go by Vicky. So hence they were, the pa panties were made for me. And so I've put them panties also where Leonardo's Vitruvius man would normally go. Next slide. And this is Vulcanizadora, um, inspired by a painting I saw in Mexico and the island of Cozumel. And it's a long story, but basically it's from a bought auto repair shop that repairs flats. But really what needs repair here is that man's you know, ego and no amount of soothing by this beautiful young woman is really going to make him feel any better. And you can see that the gato, the jack thing that they used to lift the car is very little. And it's just like the whole car is just perched so precariously and the man doesn't look like he knows how to change a flat tire. So I do not know how this is going to turn out. 
but it doesn't bode well. And the vulcanizador is what you call the tire repair shops because they vulcanize the rubber, but in this case, the real vulcanizadora is her. She's the one that burns. All right, next slide. And this image was also part of the exhibit at the Museo Alameda, and it is also inspired by a beauty parlor. It is a woman whose fingernails are very, very long, beautifully manicured, and she holds roses. And, you know, the big stereotype is, oh, the woman is as gentle as the petals of a rose, but really her fingernails are as sharp as the thorn, so watch out is what I have to add to that. And um, I happened to make this on the floor using materials that I found in either Latin American shops in San Antonio or from native trees. And so the, the manicure itself are all made from poisonous beads of the mountain laurel, as are the bracelets, the yellow bracelets. And this is uh, the last image that I wanted to show you. Thank you all for looking at the work and I hope that you look closely at um, paintings when you go past them at signage. This is from a, a shop that sells things for your house, again luring the woman in, oh you can decorate your house and it's a his and hers matching mattresses. So it's advertising twin y queen but really it's a his and hers. And so on that, I pass the baton to the next artist tonight. Well, thank you so much, Victoria. It's, it's so, um, I've always been very fascinated by your, by your beautiful vernacular paintings. And um, you touch on nature, the historic relationships, the relationship between men and women. And um, at the end of the day, all that lures all that lures the female into the shops. So thank you and always good to visit your studio. Thank you, Vienna. Now we will pass it on to Mark. And uh, Rebecca, if you could please introduce uh, Mark Clark. Let's go ahead and go to Mark. Perfect. So Mark Clark was born in Honolulu, Hawaii. He studied painting informally with Joseph P. White, Robert Stark, and Kevin McDonald. Uh, Clark has worked as an art handler in several museums across the country, and his one-person exhibits have been shown throughout the, Tex throughout the Texas Valley and the East Cro Coast. Uh, he's had many group exhibitions throughout the country as well as in Mexico, and we're really pleased to have Mark Clark here with us today to share his images and works that are both in the, in the book as well as original pieces. Oh, let me unmute. <laughs> oh, hi. Can you hear me? We can hear. Yes, you. we can. Oh, hey. <laughs> Uh, it's good to be here. Um, oh, this uh, first image here uh, brings back uh, some very uh, interesting memories. So when I worked for the National Gallery, they sent me to Mexico City because I was the only one of a thousand employees in the building that spoke Spanish. And uh, one of my jobs uh, down in Mexico City was uh, to pick up uh, the head of uh, Coyo Xauqui, which was about a 400 pound uh, green stone uh, head. Uh, Koya Shaki is uh, now a moon goddess. Uh, she was um, uh, the daughter of Quadlique, the earth deity. And uh, apparently uh, Quadlique got uh, pregnant uh, uh, by a ball of feathers and uh, the rest of the family was absolutely horrified. And um, they vowed to slay the, the baby that was going to be born. Uh, they didn't know that it was going to be a Tezcatlipoca, the smoking mirror, really ferocious uh, uh, war god. And uh, he was listening while they were plotting his demise. And so he sprang from his mother's womb, uh, fully dressed and fully armed, and uh, using his obsidian uh, bladed sword, 
uh, he cut his sister into pieces. And uh, he also slew the co-conspirators. There were 300 uh, lords that they were plotting against him. And he threw their bodies into the sky and made the Milky Way. But uh, uh, Fadlique was uh, really heartbroken at the death of her daughter. And so he tossed the pieces of uh, her corpse into the, into the sky and uh, it uh, forms the moon. I'm actually a lot fonder of other uh, uh, images of the moon. Uh, my favorite is uh, uh, the moon rabbit in Maitsley. They had uh, four or five different moon deities, uh, Tekiz Tekatl, Tekiz Siwatl, uh, uh, Maitsley, as I stated before, and even Tlazote uh The earth goddess had some control over the moon. But, uh, you know, uh, this... Uh, uh, stone that I based this uh, uh, painting on uh, was the whole reason that they uh, unearthed the Templo Mayor. Uh, they knew where the temple in Mexico City had been located, but uh, uh, during uh, after the conquest, uh, they built uh, some very nice buildings over top of it. And in the late 1970s, they were digging a gas line and discovered this stone, this enormous stone. I guess it's a uh, 13 feet in diameter, and uh, it uh, shows what you see here. I uh, had to invent the color uh, and, uh, you know, using information I gained from the codices, I took some educated guesses, and it uh, turned out I wasn't so far from uh, wrong or so far from right. Um, they uh, have this on display at the Museo de Templo Mayor now, and uh, there's a slide that comes on that shows you uh, the way that the coloring actually was. They did uh, uh, tests on the surface of the stone and uh, figured out what went where. And uh, I, was, I was close, just a, just a few minor errors, but I decided to stick with uh, my own impression. And uh, this is painting is four feet square. And uh, oh, uh, I don't agree with the misogyny in it, but uh, the history and the theology. Is, uh, well, what's beautiful important. what's beautiful about the message on this is, is is the the broken pieces the 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 broken pieces that come back into a a, a beautiful hole that represents the moon and light and uh mm -hmm. you know, there's there's uh e even um a stronger uh power from the broken pieces we'll oh, move on yeah. to the next image now oh, thank you and this is uh certainly a you know, the piece in its entirety, but here's a, a detail mm -hmm. of the women. Mm -hmm. Please tell us about this, this oh. uh, the title of this piece, and uh, oh, yeah. then uh, the depictions of the women. Oh, yeah, this is a catalog of um, uh, Mexican uh, street performers and vendors, and uh, I picked a variety of um, uh, people from various walks of life, uh, you know, from the Aztec dancers that'll dance at a stoplight uh, for spare change, um, uh, to uh, uh, elote vendors and mariachis, and uh, uh, the ladies of the night who are sharing a joint as they walk down the street. And then there's a, a lady who's uh, haggling with a, an ice cream vendor uh, because her kid dropped his popsicle and uh, she's uh, made up to appear lighter than she actually is. And, um, you know, I don't know, it just uh, seemed to be a, a kind of a cross section of life uh, in Mexico and on the border. Uh, I was very fond of um, uh, balloon vendors and did a series of paintings of globeros and uh, I was told by people in Matamoros that no Mexican would ever paint one. And uh, you know, I was just kind of um, appalled that there's uh, such classism uh, that uh, things so beautiful would be disdained by uh, people that uh, see them every day. Uh, this We're going to try to keep this on the, um, on the focus on women, Mark. Um, oh, yes. To, yeah, okay. yeah, if you don't mind. So uh, uh, let's go on yeah. to this piece. This is a... Say, uh, only one woman among the many men, if you could speak to this particular piece. Oh, okay. Uh, well, 
uh, uh, this one here, uh, uh, this is a Balacera con Suburban Roja, uh, which is um, uh, based on a photograph that a friend sent me via email of uh, the aftermath of a shootout in Reynosa. And uh, there is a female head uh, at the lower left. Uh, uh, it's been decapitated uh, by the Sicario with the uh, uh, machete. But uh, the lady in the red dress is uh, kind of screaming in horror and running away from the scene. The uh, photograph that I was sent was a really rather horrifying. Uh, I think there were a total of nine dead Sicarios in and around the uh, SUV that had been shot to pieces with a, a large caliber uh, machine gun by the Ejército, uh, the, the Mexican army. And uh, I had to clean it up. Uh, people were really kind of messed up. It was a horrifying photo and it really made an impression on me. And I wanted to uh, use the lady to convey the uh, the terrible nature of the scene. Uh, it was really disturbing, and the picture still haunts me uh, every time I think of it. But at the time I painted it, there was a great deal of violence uh, across the river in Matamoros and uh, uh, upriver in Reynosa. And uh, I thought it was important that somebody record uh, the violence that was going on on a almost daily basis on that side of the river. Yeah, uh, I can remember when Tony Tormenta got whacked and uh, Matamoros, 50 people died and I could see the helicopters circling and the plumes of smoke from burning uh, semi-tractor trailers on the road to Reynosa. Uh, this painting... Uh, well, you've certainly uh, had a very close-up view of, of the border violence and happenings. Now we move to this image you mm -hmm. have of the... The um, oh, yeah. Saludos oh. desde la Frontera, one of my favorites. Uh, mm -hmm. oh, and yeah. uh, sometimes I'm... controversial image of mm -hmm. the Rio Grande and, and uh, border wall scenario, if you could mm -hmm. speak to this. Yeah. Oh, yeah, this is the second version I did of uh, this theme. And uh, I put the um, uh, old bridge, uh, the Branzo Matamoros uh, uh, bridge that was put up in, I guess, about 1911. Uh, in the background because it's very distinctive. And um, I used to live about uh, three quarters of a mile on the other side of the bridge. I could see it from my studio before they built that stinking border wall through my view of the river. And um, I uh, really hate the wall and I wanted to uh, show my disdain for uh, the Customs and Border Protection people, the Border Patrol and uh, ICE uh, by showing how easy it was um, to uh, distract uh, the border patrolman who you see waving at the uh, pinup in the middle of the river who's uh, floating on an inner tube to distract them uh, from their job while uh, 20 indocumentados uh, swim the river behind them, uh, climb up the bank and then go over the wall. And uh, I had uh, postcards uh, made of the larger version of this that uh, I would, uh, I used to ride my bicycle along the river on the Mexican side of the wall and uh, when I encountered border patrolmen I would give them a free postcard <laughs> and uh, their responses were always rather amusing but uh, I really kind of wanted to rub their nose on it um, yeah uh, the whole uh, I don't know the whole issue the northern gringos ideas about uh, uh, Mexican immigration uh, really offend me and, uh, and you've also the, had um, some um, uh, some the the, con the controversial aspect as as well as as the, oh, yeah. the well, objectification of the objectification of women um, oh, yeah. has come up with this image. Oh yeah, well she is rather tantalizing, and um, <laughs> yeah, uh, these suckers are really uh, kind of falling for it. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I'd uh, checked a book out of the library, The Great American Penup, and uh, thought I would do The Great uh, Mexican American Penup in response to that. And so I took a sexualized uh, image of a female and uh, put it dead center in the painting and, um, and then use it to ridicule uh, the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and uh, it was very effective, but um, 
it, uh, it certainly pissed off a number of people, <laughs> including uh, the wife, wife of an ICE agent who uh, uh, called me out as uh, uh, the poster child for cultural appropriation. Um, yeah, uh, she reviewed a show I did of the Aztec deities without ever going to the show. And so... Um, uh, well, this particular image really caught my attention from the... Mm -hmm. uh, the first time, and uh, I, I mm -hmm. went to uh, your studio, vis uh, studio mm -hmm. visit, and and I'm happy to say that it now hangs in my own studio. Oh yeah! And it's, um, uh, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, oh, we're going to have to wrap it up uh, here Perfect. with. Uh, um, let's see if we have uh, Gaspar Enriquez. Thank you for including me. Adios. Thank you so much. Adios, Mark. Thank you, and and uh, it, really. Yeah enjoyed your insights, your narrative on your pieces. Um, this is got a spot in Enrique's studio. We, we had some kind of uh, glitch in communication. So I will just um, go got, through some of his. Um, well, do we have Gus spot here? Yes, we have Gus spot here. Would you like me to? OK. Please. OK. Gus spot Enriquez was born in El Paso and began his art training at the East Los Angeles Junior College. He earned his BA from the University of Texas, El Paso, and his Master of Arts and Medals at New Mexico State University. He taught art at Bowie High School on the El Paso Juarez border for decades, and many of his students provided inspiration for his work. His work has been exhibited in numerous exhibitions, uh, including the well-known Cara Chicano Art Resistance and Affirmation from 1955 to 1985, and it has been exhibited throughout the Southwest and the United States. It was also the first commission from the National Portrait Gallery for the, for the Smithsonian, so we are very, very pleased to have Gaspar here with us tonight. Can you see the images, Gaspar? I can see the images, yes. Okay, so if you could just speak about each image and we'll just uh, flip through them. Okay, this, uh, the one on the left side is um, uh, titled um, La Gebi in Red. And uh, all of the, well, the images that you probably will see, or most of them, were my students. So I started recording them when I actually started uh, teaching there because they lived in the same neighborhood that I used to live when I was growing up. The one on the right hand side is uh, La Erica, La Erica La Cholita. And uh, she was one of my, well, actually they're all my favorite students. So uh, can we go to the next one? There we go. The one on the left-hand side is called La Petsy. I did uh, another one of La Petsy y los homeboys, uh, y los cuartos. Uh, she was also one of my students. Uh, the other one on the right-hand side is um, La Sandra La Cholita, and she is actually the sister of, um, of Erica. She mm -hmm. yeah. is also one of my favorite art, uh, um, models. I used her in uh, several paintings, one of them, which is Generation of Attitudes. And she, she was actually the uh, Pachuca, the Tirilona, and the Chola. Next. This is Anna La Charra. She was, um, of course, one of my students. This is when I was doing uh, charreadas and charros and, um, and uh, charreadas. Okay, thank you. Next. Am I still on? There had yes. been a Yes, yes. We're on Anahakis. Um, uh, if you can speak to that one. Okay. Anahakis is a good friend of mine. 
she's a metal, um, she was a metal instructor at UTEP for a while, and but she does some tremendous little little um, art metal pieces that uh, describes a lot of our culture as we were growing up. Can we go to the next one? This is Susie Davidoff. And uh, I've, I've been doing a series of artists that are friends of mine and familiar and whose work I have admired and admired their dedication. Uh, so there's gonna be several of them, uh, several artists that I have painted. And I just want to add about Susie Davidoff that she has um, really places a great focus on the natural world um, that that surrounds us that I've always admired as well. But, that would be uh, her the next. background of hers. Yes. This is, this mm -hmm. is uh, Rochelle Davis, and she was a metal instructor at UTEP for a long, long time. The, the earring that she's wearing is one of her pieces. This one is Celia Munoz, also from, okay, we went back, okay. We're going to Celia Munoz and she just got, uh, uh, recently got the um, award for the uh, Art League of Houston. Um, this, this, she's all, also one of my, I admire her work and her dedication. And I want to add about Next. Celia. She, she's also from the, uh, the Segundo Barrio, um, you know, La, La Bui High. Do we where have another one? Esparti taught. And one more to add about, oh, sorry. I'm Sienna, you're, you're muted. Hang on. Unmute. There we go. Okay, sorry. She's all, Celia Munoz is also a, a Juntos um, artist and uh, from the Segundo Barrio El Paso, Texas, originally. Chihuahuita. Chihuahuita. And here's the next images. Uh, the one on the left-hand side is an uh, image of uh, a friend of mine's um, daughter, doing making her first communion i thought she had a really uh, delicate dress that's why i did her the one on the uh, right hand side is all, another one of la erica uh, this will be a profile only in black and white erica and her and sandra were two of my favorite uh, uh, models Next. This is a <clears throat> nude and the, the um, tattoo on her back is, the title of this one is Carrying the Past and she carries the past, her culture uh, in her back. The face that you will see that would be her face, since you are unable to see it. That's, I actually, actually put her face in the back. Next. Well, I believe that, uh, I believe that concludes the images um, for you, Gaspar, and, and, you know, such a, such a strong um, representation of the women here in, in El Paso, the artists here, the, uh, the t traditional and the, um, the, the, the non-traditional in a sense. Um, yes, and very representative. I, I might add that um, all of the work is airbrush, acrylic on paper. Okay. And this particular image is uh, also included in the Icons and Symbols of the Borderland book, which um, it, it, uh, it's always been a, a favorite here. And now I return to the, um, 
the book. And Rebecca, would you like to? Um... I want to thank all of the artists who were here tonight with us, um, taking time to share their work. Uh, Diana did a lot of work over the past six years putting together this traveling exhibition as well as this publication. And these are just a few of the artists that we spoke with here tonight that are represented in the book. And we encourage everyone to purchase a copy of it. It's available through our shop, juntosart.org forward slash shop. And just know that a percentage of every book purchased goes back to support the Juntos Art Association's education and outreach programming. And so we really want to thank everybody as well as the Mexican American Cultural Center for hosting this retrospective exhibition with artist and author Diana Molina. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. And um, Diana, I would like to especially thank you for all your work. You and Cesar have been tremendous in all this, doing all this work for us. Thank you. Well, it's been my pleasure, Gaspar, and, and just um, I cannot begin to express how, how grateful I am to each and every one, every artist who, who participated in the, in the making of the book and in, in the traveling exhibit. Um, it's been um, a, a great learning experience for me and, and, and a joy to j delve into the art. It makes it all worth it. And the, the very um, deep and meaningful friendships with, with so many of you. And um, thank you for participating in, in this uh, artist studio visit today. Thanks to you all. Viva la mujer. Mil gracias. Thank you. <laughs> gracias, Mark. de camisas un sombrero su vocación de aventurero seis consejos siete fotos mil recuerdos empacó sus ganas de quedarse su condición de transformarse en el hombre que soñó y no ha logrado dijo adiós con una mueca disfrazada de sonrisa y le suplicó a su Dios crucificado en la repisa el resguardo de los suyos y perforó la frontera como pudo Illegal immigration is dramatic evidence that we have a wide open border. I got involved with the Minuteman Project because I felt that our government had absolutely failed in the responsibility to secure the borders. I think that was evidenced by the events of 911. In all honesty, I absolutely hate the idea of a border fence. There is a lot of legitimate commerce that goes back and forth across the border. You know, when it's roundup time, their cowboys come over and help, and vice versa. And uh, it's going to be a sad thing to see that end. We started out with a goal of bringing attention to what was happening on our southern border. And I think we really were successful in that. The whole debate that's going on right now, we did all of that. That all came from the Minutemen. This is going to be the debate of our era. How this ends up will determine the future and the life and death of the Republic.
to stay here in this beautiful country. We have come here to work. We are just part of this country already. We are under attack. I've never felt so under attack in the place that I've lived my entire life. Our greatest fear is deportation. People in this city, in this state, and in this country are afraid every day that they're going to be deported. There is no way that we are not writing about this. There's no way that we are not speaking up about this. What brings me out here today is fellowship with like-minded writers and people who appreciate uh, poetry of resistance. Writers who have something to say about the current state of our world and care about it enough to want to change it. Don't stop until it's gone. No more borders, no more walls, no more lies. Thank you. There's been a lot of, uh, a lot of talk about border walls. And a lot of people don't realize when they talk about this wall that El Valle, the border, is a real place. We are a real people. And, the, and this, this uh, symbol that is uh, being planned and is already in place in a lot of areas in our Valle is cutting across our lives. It is a violence against us. They closed the door and the metal gate. And I could never return to my country even as I was returned to my country. For anyone who's ever been laughed at for saying sandwich, or library, or pizza, or had their name butchered by some pinche gringo who didn't even want to try, it's for being told to speak American on this soil where we rolled tortillas before we ever broke any bread. And there was a Santa Fe before there was a Plymouth Rock. There was an El Paso before there was a Philadelphia. There was a San Antonio before there was ever a Washington, D.C., and I did not write this poem for you. I wrote it for me. Thank you. Now I gotta talk to a border cop because all vehicles must stop. I was driving through the checkpoint with my dog. We're all part of 100,000 other poets that are doing this around the world uh, this, this month, this weekend. It's really a powerful feeling. I, I hope we all feel empowered by that. Guy with the gun says, you a citizen? I said, yes I am, my man. This land is my land. Our world feels dangerous in so many ways. Change begins with an idea, and then from the idea, you try to build a community around that. What can we do, poor as we are, to turn this tide of greed and lies, but resist, recede, rebuild? Mercy, love, sin guerras, sin fronteras, sin walls. Walls should not be the norm. Walls fall short of bridges. Bridges open for all. Puentes like open arms, welcoming all. Gracias. We have a lot of work to do. And it's not for the faint-hearted. I was driving through the checkpoint
it with my dog Couldn't wait to get to the other side My dog says, 